All right, guys, welcome to the webinar. So uh, if you're joining me live, appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, uh, to join me. If not, then uh, I think you'll enjoy the information either way. But uh, again, as always, if you're joining me live, you've got the little chat thing uh, there on the right-hand side. You guys can type in uh, your questions or anything like that. So go ahead and introduce yourself and say hi. You know, tell me where you're from if you want, and uh, and we'll get this going. But uh, I'll introduce myself real quick. I'm sure a lot of you know me already, but for those of you that don't, my name is James Wilson. I own MTB Strength Training Systems and uh, have the website bitejames.com. And back in 2005, I had the idea to start sharing some of the things that I've been doing in my own strength training program to help me improve as a rider with the world. And 10 years later, uh, it's pretty much become the, uh, the source for strength and conditioning stuff for, uh, for mountain biking. So over that time, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, countless riders at all levels of the game from you know weekend warriors to World Cup pros and, and everything in between. And so that's given me a really unique insight into uh, a lot of the topics that I talk about, especially the one today, which is the top five uh, exercises that I feel that you need to have in your training program, especially during the off season. And uh, so oh, we got Mark in uh, Phoenix. Hey, what's up, Mark? Appreciate you joining me today. But uh, so anyways, like I said, what we want to do, what I want to do today is, is share with you. Uh, some of the lessons that I've learned, particularly about the specific exercises that have the best transfer from the gym to the trail to help you guys get the most out of your training program and, and all of that. So what I'm going to do, I've got a short little slide presentation. And again, these slides are more to keep me on track because I have a tendency to ramble and, uh, and, and get off track. But I'm going to go through this short little slide presentation. Then what I'm going to do is actually go through the exercises show you how to do them, show you how I coach them and some of the common mistakes that people make and uh, how you can avoid those. And again, you guys will have the opportunity while we're doing that to, uh, to interact with me and, and ask any questions that you have about the exercises. And then again, at the end of the webinar, you guys can ask me any questions that you have in general and uh, I'll stick around and answer your questions. So, uh, all right, we got uh, Jonah from, wow, Nova Scotia. Excellent. Thanks for joining me. Definitely uh, appreciate the, the, the global audience there. So uh, Nate says, uh, hey, hey, what's up, Nate? So um, all right, guys. So and again, I've, I've got it uh, figured out by this point, so I'm pretty sure the slides will advance. But uh, remember that I can't see the comments while I'm doing the slides. So feel free to uh, um, you know go ahead and, and keep introducing yourself or by it likes to you know say hi and help each other out with these things, which is always fun to see as well. If you have any questions, but I can't see any particular questions as if I'm doing as I'm doing the slides. But type them in because when I'm done, I'll see them and then I can uh, get to them and then we'll get to the exercises. So uh, hopefully that sounds good to everybody and uh, and we'll get rocking. So just give me a second here with my uh, technology stuff here. Get my screen share going. And off into infinity world we go, there we go. All right, so top five MTB exercises to use this off season. Now why is this important? This is important because not all exercises are created equal and some exercises give better results than other. When I uh, sent out the email uh, letting people know about this webinar, I talked about when I first started working out and this was, you know, when I first started getting serious about strength training, was in high school and it was the typical i need to you know put on some muscle so girls will look at me kind of stuff but you know i started getting serious and so i started researching and looking into stuff and i made the mistake that a lot of people do and really it doesn't matter what you're getting into i, I see this mistake made with every with pretty much every goal that uh, people have uh in the fitness world and that's that you think that doing more is better and so you you think that having this huge collection of exercises and doing you know uh, a lot of different stuff is what's going to give you the best results and the more exercise that you can collect there's always some cool new thing that you could be doing and, and you're always looking for that and trying to figure out how to add that in but the the truth is is not all exercises are created equal and some give better results than others. So that means that, uh, you know, two things. It means that you can get better results in less time by knowing what to focus on. It also means that you can waste a lot of time. So uh, if you're not, if you don't, if you have a bunch of other exercises that don't include those important ones. 
So what this boils down to is what's known as the 80-20 rule, uh, also known as the Pareto principle. Uh, you know, the, but it basically says that 80% of your results come from 20% of what you can do. And again, you know, we can debate the exact numbers there, but the, the reality is, is the bulk of what you're going to get, the results that you get, are going to come from a pretty small percentage of the things that you're doing. And it's the big rocks thing. If you've ever heard people talk about, you know, you got to focus on the big rocks first. So it's kind of, it all falls back on those big rocks, 80-20 rule, whatever it is you want to call it. But the idea is, is that, you know, if you figure out the few key, key things to focus on that you can get the best results in the least amount of time. And so, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you have these things in your, you know, covered. And so, again, this, this applies to a lot of things in life, but uh, we're going to talk about it as it counts to mountain bike exercises today. So mountain biking has unique movement demands. And this means we need to keep those movement demands in mind when designing a training program. And so, again, like the, you know, like mountain bike, like a lot of the exercises I'm going to talk about target some of these unique movement demands but mountain biking is not road riding on dirt i've talked about this a lot and so this means that besides being able to pedal well technical skill and your movement efficiency are even more important with mountain biking than they are with uh, road cycling and just about any other uh you know cycling discipline out there and so understanding what these unique movement demands are and then how can we let the body practice these things in strength training I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit later but remember that strength training is movement practice so what this means is that you're when you're in the gym you're not trying to do more reps or, or add more weight as much as you're trying to move better and if if the more reps and the more weight are giving you a learning opportunity that allows you to move better, to, to stress proof your movement better, uh, or to increase the conditioning of that movement better, then great. But the movement demands are always, uh, you know, first and foremost. So uh, before I do get into this, though, I do want to say that this is keeping in mind the six basic human movements. And I, I touched on this too. I, I mentioned this briefly in the um, the email where I was, I was letting people know about this webinar, but this goes beyond like squatting and, and uh, doing your deadlifts and your swings and, and stuff like that. Like everybody needs to do these six basic human movements. So, uh, you know, uh, depending upon who you, you, who you talk to, where you, you know, where your influence is, these can expand or contract a little bit, but I tend to follow the Dan John train of thought on this. And so he keeps it pretty simple with hinging, which is like your deadlifting your swings, your squat which is your squat, you know, push. This includes both uh, horizontal and vertical, so doing like push-ups and also doing like shoulder presses. Uh, your pulls, again, doing like, you know, your, your horizontal rows, like inverted rows and, and uh, um, your uh, vertical ones, uh, vertical pulls, so your, your chin-ups and pull-ups. Carries, this is one that not a lot of people uh, have in their program, and I almost included it as one of the things that you want to have kind of a unique mountain bike exercise but the reality is is everybody needs to be doing loaded carries like farmers walks and stuff like that and then uh, finally you have everything else as he calls it and this includes like your Turkish get up and your single leg work and, and just some of these basic uh, like crawling groundwork things like that so everybody no matter who you are needs to have these six things in your program and what we're gonna get into is uh, some of the more specific variations of these things and some of the unique things that, that may kind of fall out of, uh, you know, some of these categories. And so, uh, so I just wanted to point that out, that this is on top of these basic things that everybody should be doing. What we're going to be talking about are some more mountain bike specific stuff. So uh, let's get into it. So the first exercise, and I'm going to buzz through these pretty quick because I know you guys want to see me do these and get the chance to see how they look. And, and so uh, I understand these are just words and, and not as exciting, but we're going to buzz through them real quick so you know what they are and, and why I like them. The first one is the stagger stance and the pedal stance deadlift. And I'll show you guys what the stagger stance and pedal stance is. And you'll see the first three exercises actually revolve around this stance. But the, the thing is, is we have a unique split stance position that we use in mountain biking, especially in the attack position. So when you, you know, you stand up and you're in that aggressive uh, attack position and you have your feet, well, you know, you should have your feet in a split stance. You shouldn't have them at 10 and 6 with one foot real low and one foot real high. That's a, a rookie move and, and uh, you can just waiting to get a foot caught on a rock. So 
hopefully uh, everyone listening to this understands that when you stand up in your attack position, you want your feet, um, you, you know, in, in a neutral position, like level with the ground. So they're, they're in the split stance position. But this is a very unique stance that we have because unlike a lot of other sports, we're not moving. We're, we're changing level in that stance, but we're not actually moving from that stance. Our feet don't actually break contact and come off of the pedals, but we need to be able to move our hips and our center of gravity, basically change levels very effectively in that split stance position. And so the split stance position is going to help uh, the what we need in the attack position, and it also helps improve switch foot riding. I'm a huge advocate of switch foot riding. Uh, you know, several benefits to it. One of the biggest ones is cornering. Your ability to put your inside foot forward on a corner is going to make all the difference in the world for you uh, in cornering. And again, you'll hear people say this doesn't matter, but then why can I predict with pretty much 100% accuracy which way you prefer to corner by which foot you prefer to ride forward with? If you prefer to ride with your right foot forward, I guarantee you prefer to corner to your right. You also deal better with switchbacks that way. You also deal better with uh, um, off camber stuff pushing you off to the left. I can predict a lot of stuff based on which foot you like to have forward. So if it didn't matter, I shouldn't be able to be a freaking fortune teller based on that, right? So it does matter. So doing stuff like these the stagger stand stuff is important. It'll help you with the switch foot uh, riding. And again, if you're a mountain biker, being able to ride switch foot is a very important skill for you, no matter what some other people say. And uh, so if you're not doing things that help you improve that in the gym, is it really a mountain bike specific program? I would argue maybe not. Uh, so we've got stagger stance deadlift. This helps with your tack position. Stagger stance and pedal stance squat. This works on your standing pedaling power and balance. This is very important. Standing pedaling is an extremely important tool for us on the trail. The trail really starts to get fun when you stand up. People say that don't stand up. It's just, you know, it's hard. It's not less efficient. That's the thing. There's no proof that it's less efficient. It's just harder because most people are weak with that movement pattern. And so if you get stronger with that movement pattern, then it's not going to feel as hard when you get up in the standing position on the bike. And again, understanding, I'll point all this stuff out, the difference between a, the, the squat and the deadlift will help you understand the difference between your attack position and your standing pedaling position because they're not the same thing. Uh, and, and keeping in mind with this that the upper back is often your real weak link with this exercise. And again, I'll, I'll point this out when I'm, I'm going over the exercise. So the third one is your stagger stance or pedal stance, dumbbell cheek curl. And this is, a, as much as I love the kettlebell swing, the problem is, is when you look at it, it's not very specific from a, a joint angle and just kind of an overall movement uh, standpoint. We've got this wide stance, it's a bilateral thing. So again, don't get me wrong, I love swings, I love using them, but if we're talking specific way to train hip power for mountain biking, um, again, we have to look at these movement patterns. Your brain is the thing that's learning during the, these uh, during strength training, right? So, if your brain is getting the opportunity to learn these how to be more powerful in a little bit more specific stance, then it's going to have a better transfer over to the trail. So, this stagger stance and pedal stance dumbbell cheat curl is extremely important for working on your horizontal hip power. Again, in our unique stance. And it's very important for manualing, bunny hopping, and jumping. Again, I'll touch on this, but the, the, the ability to drive your energy forward is the key aspect to manualing and all of these other things. Any backwards energy at all, so leaning backwards at all is bad for manualing. It's, you're, you're fighting yourself, you're throwing yourself off balance. So it's the ability to drive forward, not lean back, and that's what this works on. So the next one, uh, number four, is a windmill. It's also known as, as the corkscrew lift uh, in some circles. This is uh, an old-time strongman lift. And this is the best exercise in the world for working on connecting your hips and shoulders like you need to for cornering. Well, one of the big problems that most people have with cornering is they have what I call dead shoulders. They're moving their hips. They're trying to do all this stuff with their lower body, but their shoulders are dead. There's no connection between the shoulders and the hips. So your hips, if your hips and shoulders are connected, then one can't move without the other. And so understanding how to actually drive your, your hips from your shoulders is extremely important for cornering. 
And that's what this windmill and corkscrew lift works on. And, and I go so far as to say that if you can't windmill, then you can't corner properly. Like you may be able to pull it off, but you're, you're getting really good at working around your dysfunctions. And, and that when you can windmill, you'll be able to move better and more balanced and it'll help your cornering. So uh, that's number four. The last one, and this is kind of a fun one. I mean, I'll be totally honest with you. I, was, I could not figure out what to add for number five because there's a lot of exercises that I could have put here, like farmer's walk is one, um, you know, the kettlebell swing is one, but I was really trying to think of exercises that are unique to mountain biking and things that not everyone's necessarily, you know, heard of and used. And so the steel mace is something. I've written an article uh, on my blog about it. You guys are going to be hearing more about this in 2016. It's something I picked up, picked up, uh, you know, at the end of this year and have been using. And it is an amazing training tool for working on grip strength endurance and improving posture. And those are two huge things that we need as mountain bikers. Grip strength endurance is the other piece of the pie. Like pedaling endurance is great, but we all know that that's not the only thing that's important in mountain biking. In fact, one study showed that grip strength endurance was directly related to downhill racing performance. And so, you know, when things start to point downhill, basically your pedaling endurance is not as important as your grip strength endurance. So having that balance is extremely important, but the problem for most of us is that most of the endurance stuff that we do is very focused on the pedaling stuff. So all of the on bike, the intervals, all that stuff, it's only working on pedaling endurance. There's very little transfer from that to other types of endurance, especially grip strength endurance. And so having ways that allow you to work on grip strength endurance is extremely important for us as mountain bikers. So the Mace 360s and the 10 and 2s, which I'll show you, are really fun and you know a really great way to work on grip strength and, and posture by themselves. But you combine the Mace 360s with kettlebell swings and you have an amazing mountain bike specific cardio workout, especially from the, um, the postural endurance and the, the grip strength endurance side, which are two things that are extremely important for us on the trail. So those are the five exercises. Uh, remember that you may need to progress into some of these exercises. Uh, this is extremely important to remember. It's not doing these exercises that will make you a better rider. It's the ability to do these exercises that will make you a better rider. And so if you don't have that ability in the first place, then you may need to work on it. So, you know, you may need to work on your basic hip hinge before you start working on the stagger stance hip hinge. You may need to work on the hip hinge before you start working on the dumbbell cheek curl. You may need to work on your, your hip mobility before you start getting into loaded windmills. And so uh, understanding that if you try one of these exercises and you struggle with it, don't force it under figure out what's holding you back fix that and that's the thing is like you'll th that weak link whatever's holding you back in that movement is also one of the things that's holding you back on the trail so that's what, what you uh, one of the cool things is that you know just figure out how you're where you're struggling with these and, and by fixing that you'll uh, you'll fix a lot of, of what's going on with you on the trail as well so using these exercises will help you see better transfer from the gym to the trail and like i mentioned earlier remember strength training is movement practice for us as athletes we're not concerned about how much we move in the gym we're concerned about how we move and strength training is just an extension of movement practice for us this doesn't mean that you don't need to work hard you don't need to move some weight it's just those aren't the goals the goal is to improve your movement and especially improve it in a way that will help you on the trail and so understanding these unique movement demands especially the fact that we spend a lot of time in that split stance, uh, stagger stance position, and uh, we need to be able to have the, the hip mobility that you get from uh, the, the windmill, and we need that grip strength endurance. And so, you know, understanding those unique demands, you start to say, okay, how can I address these things? And in my experience, these five things that I went over are the best ways to address these unique mountain bike specific uh, movement problems that we face or challenges or whatever you want to call them uh, on the trail. So that's pretty much it. Uh, so yeah, that does it for the slides. For more info, visit me at bikejames.com. If you haven't been there already, got lots of cool stuff. But uh, so that's going to do it for the slides. I'm going to stop sharing now and just give me a second to get back to the
presentation. And boom. So there we are. All right. So I don't see anyone jumping on and saying, hey, the slides weren't working. So I'm going to assume that everybody got a chance to see those and they advanced. All right. So I had a bunch more people saying hi. Appreciate everybody. Oh, we got somebody in Boulder. Yeah, 10 inches of snow and falling over there. I woke up to some snow here, not quite 10 inches, but. I'm looking out my, my door. I can do a quick check. Looks like a couple inches on the, uh, the deck chair there. So, uh, so yeah, snow in here as well. well right on. Excellent. Uh, looks like uh, I got some people from Venezuela, Aruba. Perfect, man. Appreciate everybody joining me. So, um, all right. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump into the exercises uh, and go over them. And, again, I'm going to keep an eye on uh, the, the things. So, I'm going to go ahead and actually just to keep – the, uh, the the chat board here clear so I can see the newest ones coming in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and erase some of these. Again, Mike in Greenville, appreciate you joining me, buddy. Sam, appreciate it. You know, Herschel, we talked about the snow. All right. We got – excellent. Okay. Perfect. All right. Cleared them out. Nate says we got the slides. Excellent. All right. So now if I see anything pop in, I'm going to assume it's a question that one of you guys have on uh, what I'm going over. And so uh, I'm going to do that. Make a quick sip of my, my coffee here, my fatty coffee, a little, uh, little organic grass fed butter and uh, coconut oil blended up in it. So kind of a take on the bulletproof coffee, but um, helps keep my sugar consumption under control. All right. Here we go. So, first one. First thing I want to do is explain this stagger stance and pellet stance that I was talking about. So, this is a bilateral stance. I've got my feet together. And this is a split stance. Some of you are probably familiar with, the, with like a split squat, so something like this. This, somewhere between here and here, is this stagger stance or uh, pedal stance that, that I talk about. So there are actually two different uh, stances. The, the stagger stance is you're going to get set, and you want to think about it as a single leg with a kickstand. So for example, if I was going to do a single leg deadlift here, right, well, if I did a stagger stance, what I would do is I would just keep this foot uh, lightly in contact with the ground, still keeping 90% of my weight on this front leg, and I would do the same movement. So I'm not putting any weight on the kickstand, right? It's like the kickstand on your bike, you don't want to put any weight on it. It's just there to kind of hold you up, give you a little extra balance. So whenever I say stagger stance, that's what I'm talking about. Single leg with a kickstand. And what you have to watch is you don't want this foot getting too far back because now all of a sudden it starts to turn into a split stance where you have weight distributed between the two feet. What I would want is my weight to stay on this lead leg. I don't want any of my weight to transfer to the rear leg while I'm doing the stagger stance. The pedal stance, I put this foot down. And honestly, if you've been riding bikes for any amount of time, this feels very familiar. This is pretty much where your feet are when standing on the pedal. And so you can do a lot of these exercises that I'm talking about from both of these, single leg with a kickstand and pedal stance. And, you know, the, you get a little bit different uh, from, from both. You know, the, the stagger stance is going to work more on single leg uh, strength and balance and stuff like that, where the pedal stance is going to be a little more specific to the movements that we're using on the bike. So I would use the stagger stance earlier in the off season and advance to the pedal stance stuff uh, later on in, in the more specific phases. So, uh, you know, just a little distinction there, but the foot position is the same. The only difference is, am I single leg with a kickstand, or am I standing on both of my pedals and having my weight distributed between my two feet? So that stance right there, again, is uh, something that we spent a lot of time on. And, and like I said, in sport, it's really unique. You don't find, I can't think of any other athlete that, that gets their feet in this position and then they stay in this position. And then they have to basically be able to move from 
their feet being and staying in this position. And obviously, there's some, some movement as you're changing away from front to back and, and stuff like that. But uh, this basic split stance, pedal stance position, uh, our feet stay here. Like I said, we're not moving. We're not coming off the pedals or something like that. So again, you'll find athletes that have to get down in positions similar to this. But the difference is, is they're getting ready to move. They're actually going to you know, break contact with the ground and, and move. And so the ability to be very balanced, comfortable, and changing levels in that stance is important. So the first one is your stagger stance deadlift. And so the, uh, the deadlift or your hip hinge, you want to think about this one as a, a horizontal displacement of your center of gravity. What that basically means is I want my butt to move back and not down. So as I do this, I'm going to push my butt back, let my chest come down towards the ground, and I want to keep my butt as far away from the ground as I can. So it's going to come down a little bit, but I'm really trying to keep it from dropping down. So again, the difference between this and you see if I'm doing this out, the butt's like getting lower and I'm sinking down. So that's the difference between a hinge and a squat. So with the stagger stand squat, I would stay upright. My butt drops straight down, my chest stays upright. Okay, with the stagger stance deadlift, my butt pushes back and my chest comes down. And so it's being able to work this movement right here that's extremely important for us on the bike because this allows us to move in a balanced way around the cockpit. And so when we can push our butt back and let that bring our shoulders down and then our butt coming forward brings our shoulders up, it means we move from our hips, not from our shoulders. And so, you know, I'm not leaning forward from the shoulders and then trying to get my hips to catch up. And I'm not coming up with my shoulders and then trying to get my hips to catch up. That's bad movement, uh, bad core connection, and it's just unbalanced. And so, uh, you know, having that, that, that connection between the shoulders and the hips through the core and using the hips to move the shoulders. So I'm not bringing my shoulders down. I'm pushing my butt back. And as my butt goes back, that brings my shoulders down. And same thing, as I come up, I'm not pushing my shoulders up, I'm driving my hips forward, and that brings my shoulders up. At no point am I focused on my shoulders. I'm not leaning forward and leaning back. My butt goes back, my butt comes forward. So again, getting used to that in this stance, and then as you get uh, more comfortable with it, on a single leg, again, I like the stagger stance because it is single leg with a kickstand. So you'll find out your imbalances. You're going to find out like, whoa, I'm, you know, I'm really good on one side and I, you know, I struggle on the other. I'm not able to get down as deep. I'm not as strong, whatever the case may be. And so uh, it allows you to iron out those differences. And that's one of the things I was talking about. The, your imbalances in your core strength and stuff that show up in the gym, show up on the bike. I guarantee you that whatever foot you like to have forward on your bike, you're going to find that when you get in that position in your split stance, or I mean your stagger stance, your pedal stance, you're going to feel way more stable and able to move better than when you switch your feet. Well, guess what? As you iron that out in the gym, it's going to iron out on the bike as well. Like the two things are connected. So this is how you can use the gym and your gym time in the off season to fix some of these things so that you can uh, move better on the bike when you, when you get that chance to get back on there. So, um, so if you're using weight with your stagger stance, uh, deadlift, grab a couple kettlebells here. There's a couple ways to do it. I like to start out with uh, one, and you would have the weight to the inside of the lead leg, and coming down, find your weight, and then come back up. If you're doing one side at a time, what I like to do if you're coming down, the tendency is going to be to reach. You know, there's a tendency to do something like this. So what I like to do is think about the other shoulder. I'm going to push that other shoulder down to the ground. This shoulder's going to come down. The weight's pulling it down. But I'm going to actively kind of, you know, drive this one down to the ground and see if I can get it to beat the other one. Again, if you're holding weight, that's not what's going to happen, right? You're not going to get reverse twisted the other way. But you trying to do that will help keep you level which is really important part of what we're trying to do, get building that, that, that core strength. The core strength is, this is the core job. If you didn't get a chance to watch my, my webinar on uh, mountain bike core training, 
you should definitely check that out. But one of the things that I mentioned that is like the core's main job is to connect the upper body and lower body. It's not to do planks and core training. It's to make this connection. And so if you're doing this, but you're missing this connection, you know, the upper back's not in a good spot or, you know, twisting just a little bit, all this can be great from here to down, but we're missing this connection that we're looking for. And so we're not getting uh, everything that we want from a movement standpoint. So again, if you're using more weight, but it's causing you to twist, it's probably not the best thing for you. You're going to do better with less weight and better form. So anyways, so as you get better, as you get stronger, you can use uh, two weights. Again, this works for dumbbells, kettlebells, whatever the case may be, one on either side. And this also works for barbell. You can do a barbell stagger stance deadlift. And so, um, you know, pretty much any of your main deadlift variations you can use with a stagger stance as well. And uh, it just gives you, again, a single leg with a kickstand. And then again, as you get better at that, you get those, that stuff ironed out, the single leg stuff ironed out, you can start to go a little more specific and start to use the, the pedal stance. And so again, you just get set, like you're gonna do your stagger stance. But now, we're gonna go ahead and drop that heel, and we're gonna get our feet set. We want our feet set relatively straight. Again, that can be turned out just a little bit, but again, remember, what you practice in here your brain's learning, and so the, 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 like the closer the positions are to the bike, the better that transfer is going to be. Now, again, we're not trying to perfectly recreate what we do on the bike, but little things like foot position, right? These things matter, and so if you're in here, your feet are split out like this, doing this stuff, but you get on the bike, and, and you know we don't want them like this. It's, it, you know we want them more a little more forward like this. Again, this stuff matters. So just making sure that your feet are, are in a good position, and then it's basically doing these, the same thing, doing your butt back and your chest down, except that now we're keeping our weight a little more distributed between the, the, the front and the back leg. Now, as you push your hips back, your weight is going to shift back to this back leg a little bit more. So it is different from, like I said, from your brain's perspective, these are two different things, but they are, you know, they're, they're closely connected so that they're a good way to learn. So again, like, you know, the stagger stance is a great way to learn the basics of this so you can go to this and get more out of it. And so, uh, so anyways, hopefully this is making sense with using those two, two stances. Um, so there's your, your stagger stance deadlift. And yeah, that's working on that attack position if we're, you know, we're in this the pedal stance center, we're down here, and this is basically our attack position on the bike. So uh, getting ourselves comfortable in, uh, in using our hips to move us through the, around the cockpit forward and back like this is, uh, is what we want. So the next one is our stagger stance squat. And I touched on this one already. The, the difference is instead of doing your uh, butt back and chest down, now we're gonna bring the butt down and keep the chest up. And like I mentioned, upper back is usually the weak link in this. So as you come down, you don't want this happening. You don't want the shoulder blades to come untucked. You need to keep the shoulder blades tucked in the back pocket, shoulders in a good strong position, and don't lose that posture to come down. And again, what you're practicing here is gonna show up on the bike. And so if you're practicing bad upper back position, bad posture, it's going to show up on the butt. So again, butt down, keeping the chest up. So I come up, I'm driving through my balanced foot, squeezing my glute nice and tall and thin. If I'm going to hold some weight, a couple ways you can hold it in the goblet position, like so. You can hold it opposite in your rack position, or you can hold uh, one in each. So uh, a couple of different ways to to uh, to do that. Um, so the pedal stance is just a little bit different. We're not going to get to, uh, again, this is a little bit more of a specific movement. So you're not going to be able to come as deep with it. This is more of just kind of a, a getting a feel for this up and down movement in the cockpit. And so I don't use this one nearly as much as I do the pedal stance deadlift. The pedal stance deadlift is way more specific, way more applicable. But uh, this is just one, like I said, I like to you know, use it every once in a while. But the main one that I'll use to help with the standing pedaling 
is the stagger stance. Because again, the, the unique thing when you stand up, you're going to more of this single leg. When you're in your attack position, you're balanced, your feet are split, you're balanced between the front and back leg. When you stand up and you go to pedal, you're, you're transitioning into a true, into more of a true single leg, uh, um, you know, movement. And so, and it's really good because, if, you know, getting all technical, it's a single leg, semi-supported. So it's not a true single leg like a pistol squat where you have no, no support with the other leg. Because your foot is still in contact with the pedal in the back, you're still getting a little bit of support, a little bit of balance from that back foot. And so, again, that's what makes this the stagger stance, uh, you know, really good and such a great specific um, exercise to work on your standing pedaling because it's going to allow you to work on that single leg with a kickstand, which is pretty much what you want to be happening when you're standing up to pedal. And again, standing pedaling is not, you know, in this attack position standing up. You actually move your hips. So when you stand up to pedal, you want the hips to move forward so that you can get them on top of the feet, everything gets stacked on top of each other. So understanding that standing pedal is a different movement pattern than the attack position goes a long way towards helping you with your with your standing pedaling. Um, again, a lot of people who tell you that standing pedaling is you know inefficient, and don't stand up, they just simply don't know how to do standing pedaling properly. You know, it's like you know, standing pedaling is not hard. What you're doing is hard, and that's not standing pedaling. Like that's you know my reaction most of the time when people tell me that because I'm like I don't know what you're doing. That's not standing pedaling. So let's not judge standing pedaling based on whatever that is. Um, so there's your stagger, uh, stagger stance uh, squat. Now the dumbbell cheat curl. So I'll show you this one. This one's a really cool uh, variation. So for those of you who don't know, your your standard dumbbell cheat curl is this. When you're using the hips to bring the weight up and the hips catch. So it's very similar to a kettlebell swing, except for using a narrower stance, right? But the same, it's the same exact idea where I'm not using my arms. I'm using my legs. I'm using my hips to both catch the weight and then generate the force by bringing the hips forward. And again, that brings my shoulders up, right? So my hips come forward, my shoulders come up, and that weight but that's what brings that up. So you can do this both in your uh, stagger stance, so single leg with a kickstand, you know? Again, it's a little dangerous to tell you to do a single leg dumbbell cheek curl, so that's where this comes in. Really working on that single leg straight. And then again, you can drop the hips, or drop that rear uh, heel, get into your pedal stance. And again, now the weight's gonna shift back a little bit. But this is a more specific stance to what we're using on the bike. And again, just getting that feel. We're using the hips, and that specific, uh, you know, uh, foot position is going to help a lot on the bike. Now, again, this isn't the point of this. I'm not going to get too far into this, but uh, one of the biggest problems that people have when they're trying to learn how to manual is not understanding how to project weight. Their their energy forward and instead using energy coming back. So if I use my arms to pull my front end up, what direction are my elbows going? Back. Okay, so I have backwards energy trying to, well, I'm going forward, right? And so that's one of the, the main reasons that this doesn't work. You pick up and you have no balance and it goes right back down. Well, the other problem that you run into is when you hear to lean back, throw your shoulders back. So if you do this, Right, but again, what direction are my, my shoulders moving? Backwards. So you run into the same problem. Now, this looks a little bit better, and it may work a little bit better than this, but this is running into the same issue where you come up and you're unbalanced because now you have backwards momentum fighting yourself. You're trying to move forward, but you're generating backwards momentum. Now, once I learn how to use my hips, right, and drive my hips forward, what direction are my shoulders going? They're not going backwards, they're going up. So now my hips are moving forward, my shoulders are moving up. There's no backward momentum being generated uh, from that movement. And that is one of the key things that you need to learn how to do to manual, which is what starts to unlock things like jumping and bunny hopping and doing drops and all of those things. But it's that ability to you know, drive the hips forward 
and let that that forward momentum bring the shoulders up instead of relying on some sort of backward momentum to bring the front end up that will uh, that will really make a big difference. So um, so there you go. There's your uh, pedal stance, the stagger stance, dumbbell cheek curl. So that covers those three. So that's our hip hinge, our squat, and then just kind of our explosive hip hinge, which are you know three of the main movement patterns that you're going to use on the trail. And it's just making sure that we're using them in a in a foot position that's more specific to what we actually encounter on the trail. So you know, I go so far as to say if you're not doing the stagger stance stuff. And uh, you know the pedal stance, uh, um, deadlift, and, and uh, dumbbell cheek curl. Um, you know it's not really a mountain bike specific program because you're missing a very important element. Uh, again, this isn't saying this is the only thing you need to be doing. These are specific things. You know you 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 need to uh, add these in. You know this again, this isn't the only five you need to be doing. It's just in your program when you're looking at the next three, four, five, six months, however long you have planned out. You know are these things in your plan somewhere? And if they are, great. If not. You need to figure out where they probably need to fit it. So, all right, last two we're going to jump into is the uh, um, the uh, windmill and then the 360. So, the windmill you can use either a kettlebell or a dumbbell. Uh, it's traditionally done with a, a more commonly done, I guess, with a kettlebell. So, I'll show up with a kettlebell, but just remember that everything's the same with that. But you're going to get your weight, you're going to get it set up over your head. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a step forward, and we're going to get into our pedal stance. Okay, so this right here, you know, if I was to do this, I do stagger stance, heel down, it's pedal stance. So my feet are split just a little bit. You know, I'm not real narrow, I'm not real wide. You should feel real similar to where your feet would be on the pedals. So your first step from here is going to be to shift your weight. To this back leg. So I kind of unweight this front leg. So now I've got single leg with a kickstand going on. Now to drive this movement, I'm not worried about my hips. I'm worried about my shoulders. I talked about this. This is one of the problems that people run into is they don't understand how their shoulders drive their hips. So they end up with dead shoulders. So what I want to do is I want to get this shoulder here to point down at the ground. You'll notice as I do that, my hips automatically rotate and do what they need to do. And then I just drive my hips back over my feet to bring me up to the top. Now, if I just try to do this from the hips, you see like it, it looks much different. If the hips are moving and the shoulders are trying to catch up to the hips, that's much different than if my shoulder moves and that drives the hips. Like that. So getting the shoulder to drive the hips is the most important aspect of that windmill. Now, you know, how similar this is to cornering is pretty uncanny. It's kind of crazy. So again, if we're cornering, I'm taking a, you know, this is my left, so I'll my left foot forward. I'm going into this corner, I don't want to be balanced, right? Like if you go into a corner balanced, you're screwed. You need to be ahead of the, the corner. So you need to go into the corner with your weight shifted just a little bit, ready as soon as you hit the corner to start initiating your action. If you're neutral, and then you have to shift, and then you have to initiate. So we don't want that, right? So we're here. We're going to shift the weight just a little bit. So it's just like with the windmill. I shifted my weight to this back leg. And what that does is it, it pre-hinges the hips. It gets everything set, ready to move. And now, as I go into my corner, I drop this shoulder to the inside, and the hips drive to the outside. Now, again, you'll notice I'm not doing this. This is where people screw up. They, they dive in like this, too much weight to the inside, and fall over. This is where this whole corkscrew idea comes in. If I can drop my shoulder and my, my shoulders stay on top of my feet, but my hips kick to the outside, now I'm balanced, right? Now I don't have that falling to the inside uh, thing going on. So the thing is, you do have to lean your body in the corner of your bike. You just have to learn how to lean your body in a way that's balanced. And, and, and most people don't understand how to do that. So they'll lean, they'll keep their hips on top of their feet and lean their shoulders in. Bam. Oh, man, leaning to the inside is bad. Don't lean your body, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 You need to learn how to lean your body. You know, if you, if you lean your shoulders and your shoulders stay over your, your feet and your hips kick to the outside, 
Now you stay balanced and you're able to corner better. So again, you watch any, any good rider in the corner, you'll notice they don't have dead shoulders. You don't see this going on with good riders. You see this, their shoulders, their shoulders are definitely angled with the corner. You don't see them going in and keeping their shoulders level with the corner and trying to use their hips. And so getting those shoulders connected to the hips and understanding how to use them to drive the hips, extremely important. So like I said, if you can't windmill properly, I, I go so far as to say like you could, you could do better with your cornering once you learn how to do this better. And so, uh, so anyway, so there's your windmill. Um, I saw a couple things pop up. I'm going to check real quick and see uh, where we're at. Um, all right. Nate wants to know if we can demo the cheat curl once more. Yes. Nelson wants to know. Yeah, you know, and just so everybody knows, I am posting the replay link with the slides and all that. So if you registered, you'll get uh, one email automatically to you. And if you're catching this live after the uh, fact or something, then somehow you found it already. Uh, but you can find it at Bike Jams. I'll be posting it up there in the next uh, week or so. So uh, anyways, yeah, so thanks for joining me, Nelson, if you got to run. Uh, but Nate, yeah, let me demo that uh, cheat curl real quick one more time before I jump on to the Mace uh, 360s. And then we'll uh, see if anybody else has any more questions and go from there. So the cheat curl, again, we're set. You got your, your single leg with a kickstand. You got your pedal stance, but you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, right? Even if you're doing bilateral, whatever it is, the idea is that you're using your hips to generate the movement. So it's butt back, chest down, and then you drive. You know, I think about driving through my balanced foot. You know, people say drive through your heel, but the problem is, is you start to see people get crazy and their toes start coming up off the ground because they're trying to push through their heel. You want to drive through your balanced foot, right? You want to drive, actually, you want to be applying force midfoot. So I think about driving through a good balanced foot, I'm squeezing my glute, and I get tall and thin. Top position, I'm thinking about trying to, you know, get the top of my head as close to the ceiling as I can, getting tall and thin through here. So what I don't want is to lean back, right? So this move right here is bad for the low back. You're not generating power from the hips. And that's actually the exact movement pattern we're trying to not do on the bike. That's what's going to screw you on the bike is when you go to, to lift the front end or jump or something, and you do this instead of this. Okay, so the... One of the things that helps if you think about keeping your biceps connected to your ribs, because if you're if you're doing this, right now I'm using my arms, but if my biceps stay connected to my ribs, then I know I'm using my my body or my hips, I guess would be the, the right thing. So that's what you want it to look like. Catch with the hips, drive, catch back at the top. So that right there. And again, the balance foot's important because if you're leaning too far forward, you'll feel your weight shift to your toes, right? So we don't want that. That's a telltale sign of you uh, when you come down that you're not pushing the butt back and letting the shoulders drop, shoulders drop straight down. You're leaning forward and the shoulders are coming in front of the feet. So that's another good telltale sign of a good hip hinge is the shoulders will stay relatively over the feet, whether you're doing a swing or a deadlift or you know whatever it is, you'll see the shoulders stay over the feet for the most part, not drop in front of the feet. So you know you're looking down and you're like, hey, hey what's up? Foot way back there. Pretty good sign that you're not in the right position. But if you looked at your foot, if you're paying attention to the balance of your feet, you should know that already because you'll feel your, your weight shift to your toe, which is not what we want. So Maintaining a, a good balanced foot through all of this uh, is again really important. And again, not to you know, uh, this is the reason that the catalyst pedal that I created is better and works so well because all of this stuff that we're doing in the gym, that's the what you're able to recreate with the catalyst pedal with the same balanced foot driving through the strong balanced foot through the midfoot able to you know achieve all of the same uh, stuff that we're working on in the gym now you're able to do that uh, you know really on the bike because you have a platform that the ground allows in here so um, anyways 
just got to throw that in there real quick. But again, it's like what we're practicing in here. If you want maximum transfer from here into the gym, you also have to think about well, how does the human body best move in the gym? Now, how can I transfer that to the bike? Just like I need to be thinking about what are the unique demands of the bike, and how can I work on that in the gym? I also need to think about how to, what do I know about in the gym? How does the body best move? And how do I apply those insights to how to get the, the best out of the bike? So, um, so anyway, so there's the dumbbell cheat curl. So uh, another one will pop up and take a look at this question here, but hopefully, Nate, that, uh, that answered your question. If you have any more specific ones, feel free to throw them in there. And uh, all right, Raymond, what are the recommended weights for use on those exercises? You know, again, the um, people hate this crap, right? You wish that I would just say, I use 35 pounds. Five sets of five, 35 pounds. You know what I mean? And it, it's, it's not quite that easy. I'll, um, for me, you gotta, you gotta look at it again. If we're looking at it as movement practice, right? What you're looking for is a weight that creates a, a learning opportunity for you. So in general, you know, I, I, I guess probably the easiest way to answer this is what I would like to see is, is people being able to do a stagger stance deadlift with at least half their body weight um you know close to their body weight i mean so if you weigh 180 pounds uh you know you should be able to do a, a stagger stance deadlift with 90 pounds in each hand and you know bang out a few reps and it not be the hardest thing in the world for you to do um you know doing the stagger stance squat i'd say you know somewhere from that like you know 25 percent uh 50 percent body range uh, body weight range so for for me being able to do it with a you know 50 pound kettlebell uh, you know, that's, that's good. It, you know, I, I can do more, but again, we're just talking about like, you know, what just kind of some basic standards, I guess, things for you to, to aspire to and, and to, to push towards, um, you know, with the, uh, with the cheek curl, you know, that one's kind of tricky because you can get too heavy with it, but you know, I'm just using 20 pounds right there. So remember power is mass times speed. And so, uh, you know, more weight isn't always the answer in a power exercise. Like moving faster with the same weight creates more tension and stress. And so that's why like swings and a lot of power exercises, um, you know, it may just be like move faster, you know, don't worry about go going heavier as much as move faster. But I would say somewhere in the 20 to 30 pound range would be a good place to start for the, uh, for the dumbbell cheek curl. And then with the windmill, the windmill, you got to be real careful because you are looking for rotation out of the hips. And if you don't have good internal hip rotation, you're going to start rotating through the low back. And so you want to, uh, um, there's an exercise, a stick windmill, I'll show you here real quick. But uh, I'll show you guys this one real quick. So... Yeah, I've got a video of this one on my uh, on my blog. This is one of my favorite ones. I, I recommend everybody start out with this one before you start worrying about weight. Everything is the same, right? Get set in pedal stance. Shift your weight to the back foot. Drop into the shoulders to the inside. I'm trying to get this elbow lodged on the inside of this knee. So I'll show you from a little bit different angle here. So again, shift the weight. That's extremely important. I can't emphasize that enough. It, both on the bike when you're cornering. And when you're doing your windmill, you have to shift your weight to that back leg a little bit to open up the hinge to allow you to move. It's, it, it works so much better than trying to stand, go from this neutral position. So shift the weight, then go, right? So not shift and go, it's shift, then go. Get that elbow locked on the inside. And you can see my low back, like I'm not, you know, like this is, I would not want to see this. Like if somebody's, you know, like this or something, I, I would not be giving you weight. You know, you don't want to be uh, bending and rounding a lot through that low back area. Again, if you're doing a stretch like this, this is fine. This is unweighted. Um, you know, so this isn't going to, uh, you know, hurt you the same way. Obviously, you don't need to push, you know, yourself into some pain or something like that. You can, but take that as a challenge. But uh, my point is, is with the windmill, Start out body weight, and, and honestly, I have people use just the stick windmill for months sometimes, and they see great results on the trail from it. So remember, adding weight is just stress-proofing the movement. If you, 
how well you move is the primary thing. Then once you do that, then you add weight because that helps you stress proof the movement. But uh, um, how you move is always the most important thing. But with a kettlebell windmill, once you're able to do it, uh, again, I would say somewhere in the you know 20 to 24 kilos, so like 45 to 50 pound range, uh, able to do you know uh, you know three, four, five reps without it being amazingly hard would be a good indicator of having solid uh, uh, core strength, I guess, for the for the windmill. So, and then the Mace 360s, which I'm going to show here in just a second. I, um, I, I'll, I'll touch on that, but a 10 pound mace is plenty to start with. They're freaking stupid, hard to handle. So, uh, 10 pounds is a good place to start. So, let's see. Jacob had a question here. Let's see. Let's see, so Jacob, most of my fellow riders here still keep talking about pushing and pulling with the feet, but it'd be a waste of time and time then to get them try something like this since they use their muscles in another way. Um, I think I know what you're asking, uh, Jacob. And so here's a funny thing, all right? This is a little side story, but your question is actually what led me to start this like this flat pedal thing that I got myself into somehow. Um, what happened was I started training a guy named Aaron Gwynn. And most people know who Aaron Gwynn is. And uh, I felt that if, you know, this is before he'd, he'd gotten really to the World Cup level, world, uh, level and, and stuff. But, and anyways, point is, is I recognize like this guy is really good and he's going to be going far. And he was my first uh, guy that I was working with that, was going to be at this, at this, you know, high world cup level. So I said, I owe it to myself to know how uh, clipless pedals work because I, I need to design programs that maximize how they work. And all this time, like I've been riding flats, but I thought that, you know, that uh, I just was still thinking that I'm giving something up by not being able to pull up on the backstroke and all this stuff. But, you know, I wasn't noticing enough on the trail to really stress about it. So that's why I wasn't, hadn't switched, but my point is, is that's me saying, okay, how do clipless pedals really work? How does this push and pull thing really work so that I can now look at how do I maximize this? What am I talking about here? What are the real movement demands of mountain biking? Okay, now how can I address those things with my strength training program? Well, if one of the real movement demands of mountain biking is pushing and pulling at the same time, then I need, to, I need to know that. I need to look at that and I need to understand well, what are some things I can do to maybe enhance that and work on that in the gym. And that's actually what, why I started asking questions and started looking into it and started to find out that it's all bullshit and that it's not true and that you're not pulling up on the backstroke and there's not any proof in that it's, it's mind numbing. Like one of my next webinars in the next here in the next month or two is going to be on the science of the pedal stroke. It's mind numbing the amount of science that actually exists showing us that what we're told, you know, push and pull and pushing through the ball of the foot, both of those things have no basis in science and are just completely constructs of somebody's theory from decades ago. And it, it, it's insane. So anyways, uh, Jacob, my point is, before I go too far off on this tangent, that uh, I, I would challenge them, I, I would tell them the exact same thing. It's like, you know, where's the, like, you, you need some sort of proof, like something that shows you what's actually happening when you pedal. So now I can understand how to better train it in the gym. Well, once you start doing that, that's when you open the can of worms. So I guess like my, uh, um, my, my point is, is that if people are pushing and pulling on the bike, they're using their body wrong. And so what we're doing in the gym, the stuff that I'm showing you right now, this is how to use your body right. Okay, again, we, we, how, how does the human body best move? Now, how do we apply that to the bike? Again, right? So that's, that should be the thought process. And, and that's not the thought process that was used that arrived at this whole pushing and pulling BS. It was, well, you know, how we were designing a machine from scratch, from theory. What would we have it do? Okay, well, let's tell the human body to do that and not pay attention to what it prefers to do. The human body is made to push, not pull. So everything that we're working on is helping you maximize your ability, your core strength, your glutes, all that stuff to, uh, to, to push effectively 
And that is where your power and your pedal stroke comes from, not from pulling. And so if anyone's trying to pull up, they're just using their body wrong. And, and so anyways, I, I hope that answers your, your question. But the, the reality is, man, I, I would continue to just challenge people to say that. It's like, where's the proof? You know, you've got the Flat Pedal Revolution Manifesto. There's two studies in there, maybe three, uh, you know, and, and some anecdotal evidence that, that directly point to like pulling up is not what you want to do. Just challenge them like, okay, where's your science to the, to the contrary? You know what I mean? And you'll find out real quickly it doesn't do so much. Sorry, got pulled off to the side. But this does actually, you know, some people are like, well, why do you care, James? Why does it matter? Because it matters if we can't even, if we can't even uh, agree on how to pedal our bikes. What are we doing here, people? What are we doing? What are we training? You know what I mean? It's like, do you push and pull or not? You know what I mean? It's not a matter of opinion. There's a right way to do this. There's a best way to do this. And the functional movement, the logic, and the science all point towards just pushing. And this pushing and pulling be not being good. So it's like, well, then now we can better design training programs. Now we can help riders better with this knowledge. But as long as we're like, oh, what does it matter? People can choose what they want. They can push and pull if they want. It's like, no, no. Now we're hurting people, right? It's kumbaya, hold hands around the campfire. Um, you know, is uh, it, 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 it's great, except that it's, it's holding us back as a sport. Because, like I said, if we can't even agree on how we're pedaling our bikes, what the hell are we doing here, people? And if we're not going to use science to help point us in the right direction of how we're pedaling our bikes and how to use that information to help us with strength and conditioning stuff to improve our performance on the bikes, then what are we doing? Let's just go, you know, with the voodoo. Let's just go all in and just freaking start sacrificing chickens and tossing their bones and saying, like, that's the intervals we're doing today because that's what the freaking voodoo says. Anyways, sorry. You can tell this stuff gets me worked up because it just doesn't make any sense to me. It just it still drives me nuts that I have all this science on my side, but I'm the crazy one. So uh, there we go. Mace, yes, Ed. So he wants to know if we're recording this. We are. And Sean, the Mace is coming. So here we go. Mace 360. All right. Here we go. Oh, so now when you get old and you sit down for too long. Take a second for your knees to warm back up. All right, so here's the Mace. This is a 10 pound mace. Uh, like I said, this is a lot harder than you would think it would be to deal with. So this is your mace 360. It is holding the mace, bringing it around the head, just like that. Show you from the side. Now, a couple things going on here. First, you'll notice that uh, I got to Stay still here. I don't want to move around a lot. I want to create a pillar and get my arms to move around that pillar. That's going to be a lot easier than if I'm trying to move my head and, and uh, you know, duck and dodge and stuff like that. The other thing that you want to uh, keep in mind is it's, I, I tell people it's kind of like jumping from one rooftop to the next. Like you got to commit to the rep. You can't feel your way through this. It's kind of like doing a kettlebell swing. If you've ever seen someone try to feel their way through a kettlebell swing, it doesn't work. You just got to do it. And so when this thing starts to fall to the side, you tip it to the side and it starts to go, just let it go. And then use that energy. In fact, if you put your energy into winding it up, it'll unwind so much easier. But if I try to control it, and then, you see, like, you, I can't, like, a lot of this stuff happens from not using, that's easy, right there. So that's your 360. You want to be able to go both ways. You want to be able to do it with either hand on top, and this will really, you'll be amazed at how much difficult it is with one hand compared to the other, and how to work that out. And then you've got what's called the 10 and 2. And so you're going to, Get one. So if you're looking at a clock, right? So this would be, I mean, from my perspective, this is 10. It's 2, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. So you never quite go all the way back up. So there's never that little moment of balance and rest that you can get. So that's the Mace 360. 
it's, it's actually not as hard as it looks. Um, and so you can get the mace, you can also use a sledgehammer. Uh, you just kind of got to watch the head if it's a little bigger, if you don't want to hit yourself in the, in the butt with it because it can hurt. Um, but uh, so yeah, so that's basically it. The, the, the grip strength endurance stuff from this is really good. And like I said, if you combine this with kettlebell swings, it's a great workout. So one of the things that I like to do is I'll do 10 uh, single arm swings on each arm. So, you know, set, you know, boom, boom. After I get done with 10, switch it off. I'll do 10 on the other arm. And that'll be 20 total. Then I'll put it down. I'll grab my mace and I'll go into my 360s. Do a 10 one way, and then do a 10 the other way, like that, and then put it down, and then do the swings again. And when I do come back to my mace, I want to switch which hand is on top, and uh, you know, just alternating that. But just doing that, you know, six, eight, ten times, going back, doing your, uh, um, you know, 20 swings and 20 uh, mace 360s is is a awesome way to work on grip strength. Like one of the things that you run into is with the swings is you can only do swings for so long, right? I mean, you can't do five minutes worth of swings in a row. And so uh, being able to do the swings and then switch to the mace, because now you're working on your grip strength in a little bit different way. So you're keeping this continuous uh, grip strength work going on with this continuous tension on the, on the grip. And so that's gonna allow you to uh, you know, build your grip strength and endurance even better than just using the, uh, the kettlebells alone. So again, adding the base 360s in, you can, I mean, you can see if you're if you're struggling with the posture, it's going to be hard. You know, you have to have good posture. It really opens the chest up, gets to those shoulders back. You know, all counteracts all of this crazy stuff that we're uh, you know that happens when we're doing this on the bike and in our everyday life. And so. Um, so helping with the posture and helping with the grip strength endurance are two things that really uh, go a long way um, to helping us out on the trail. And so that's what I like to do with the mates. And so uh, got a couple questions coming in. And so I'm going to jump on those here in just a second. I want to show you guys real quick with the mates. There's a couple other cool things you can do. Just even like doing like basic stuff like, you know, spear stabs with it, doing what they call, uh, you know, grave diggers, you know, so some really good, fun stuff. And then we got one, I made this one up myself, call this the dance of death. And so you get a stab, switch, swing, switch, you're ready to go again. Stab, switch, swing, switch. So anyways, really fun. And uh, so besides, just, you know, the 360s, the Mace 360s, which are an amazing exercise in and of themselves. The Mace is just a really fun, cool tool to add to your toolbox that allows you to, uh, to hit uh, some, some different unique movement patterns and stuff like that. So uh, there you go. Like I said, you guys will be hearing more about the Mace. I'll be incorporating that in some more stuff. So we've got a couple questions here. So that does it for the exercises. If you guys have any questions on those, pop them in. If you guys got any questions in general about your, your training, off-season stuff, whatever um now's the time to throw them in and i'll hang out for a few minutes uh, for a bit here and we'll uh we'll answer some more questions here so ryan is uh got a little bit of a see he's got glad you like it so far awesome second mile balancing gym time and ride time no doubt my core and overall strength is lacking and holding me back not only as a rider especially standing pedaling but more importantly as a human that isn't getting any younger I read back pain Yes, and how that goes, I turned uh, 40 in uh, like two weeks. And so luckily, back pain has been under control because a lot of the stuff does help, man. As you get older, your priorities definitely do change. I was talking to one of my buddies uh, the other day about that. Like eventually, you got to grow up, right, and realize like, holy crap, um, priorities change. And, and living a pain-free life uh, starts to become more important. So anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I know what you mean there. So I average 20-plus hours of riding a month. Any substantial workout time will cut into that significantly. And I'm worried about dropping off. I live in a climate that allows me to pedal 12 months a year. Any tips or advice on finding a proper balance to maintain riding endurance while maximizing strength? Cool, excellent. So great question. 
Um, what it comes down to is energy management, right? And so, you know, you talk about okay, you average 20 plus minus hours of riding a month and you're, uh, you're trying to figure out how to fit in the other stuff without that necessarily suffering um, quite a bit. And so the, here's the couple things you got to remember. Um, one of the ironies of training is that sometimes, you know, you got to get away from your sport to get better at your sport. I'm sure we've all experienced this where like you took some time off, maybe it was forced or not, but you got back on the bike and you actually felt like pretty stinking good. Like I'm talking like six months, but you know, just taking a little time off the bike can actually refresh you and get you better. So a lot of times these drop offs are in our head, right? So if you're averaging 20 hours of, of riding a month, I mean, that's roughly what, like four or five hours a week. Um, so again, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think, so how many hours, I mean, how many rides would that be? Like two, three rides a week. The, the, you're, I, how do I, how do I put this? The, I mean, the truth is if you know that your core strength and stuff is holding you back, then that's what's going to make you a better rider, not more time on the bike necessarily. And so there's a balance here. Like you're, you're a mountain biker, so you need to ride your bike. So I never like to tell people like you need to, you know, cut back completely or not ride your bike because that's just unrealistic and it's not what you want to do. But the reality is, is that you'll actually ride better if you're able to uh, improve some of these other things and, and enjoy riding more. And so what I would suggest, and, and this is the other thing that the energy management part comes in with every ride and every workout doesn't have to be hard. And this is one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is they think like, if I'm not riding hard and I'm not training hard, then I'm not making good use of this training time and I'm, I'm wasting it and I, and, and, you know, I just need to be working hard. The, the reality is the bulk of your training time, both rides and in the gym should be moderate. You know, you're, you're really what you're, improvements come from expanding your comfort zone, not from continually testing your limits, right? If you expand what your 80% is, your 100% will expand with it. But if you're just constantly pounding on that 100%, you're going to burn yourself out. And this is where people uh, try to figure out, okay, I, how do I balance stuff? Because every ride's hard and every workout's hard. Well, that's not going to work. There's no balance there. So what I recommend is even if you, if you live somewhere where you can train all year round, I, mean, I used to live in Hawaii, I used to live in Southern California, so I understand. But the, the thing is there should be times during the year where the emphasis changes, right? So it doesn't mean you stop riding. Like off season to me is more of a, a change in emphasis to, um, to uh, trying to fill in the, the gaps, the, 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 the fundamental movement gaps and, and the things that we need as a human that are holding us back as a mountain biker. And then the end season is when we're focused more on the mountain biking. We're riding more and, and, and that's more of the focus. But even then you always want to have the other elements. So, you know, your quote unquote off season time, the riding is, is, you know, I say put in the back seat, but that's pretty much what happens. You know, you de-emphasize the riding, you know, you, you get, uh, you know, you, you don't, if you're not able to add more hours and you have to cut into your riding time to get these other things in, well, that's what you do. And it, but just knowing this is where having a plan comes in on the grab my Swiss ball. Cause one of the problems is if you don't have a long-term plan and you don't understand like where you're going, it's hard to, to commit to this stuff. Right? So like right now, if you understand that like, okay, I'm going to take three months and this is my plan. And at the end of that three months, well, then I'm going to, you know, either reevaluate, make a new one, or I know what my plan is. I'm going to shift um, to, uh, you know, to, to something else. Then it makes it a lot easier to, to focus on that. So um, Raymond's busting out to a meeting. Thanks, Raymond. Yeah, we'll have the replay up. So if you need to, to get it later, um, you can do that. But uh, the, um, my, my point is, is that you're, if you have a plan, it makes it easier. So again, this is one of the things, you know, like trying to, you know, uh, like having something like the ultimate MTB workout program, you know, part of the, the, the cool thing with that is like, 
well, it's a plan and coach says so. And you know, you know, you can see like where this is going. And so it makes it a little easier for you to not panic in the short term. And so if you see like, oh man, I'm not riding as much for the first couple phases, but you see that by the end you're riding a ton and, and, and things have shifted, then it, and you understand that, okay, well, by the end of this, I'm going to be riding way better. Um, it makes it so much easier mentally to, to do that stuff. So it's kind of a, you know, the, it's a two part thing. It's one, it's, it's having the long term plan so that you can have the long view of being able to take a step back and say like, all right, if I de-emphasize my writing right now and it takes a half a step back, but I'm, I'm, I'm gaining these, these, these movement and these core strength things and all these other things that I'm lacking right now, then I come back and it's actually going to help me take two steps forward with my writing instead of being stuck in the same place. Again, it's easier mentally to do that. The other thing is just understanding the energy management thing. So you're always wanting to have some strength training and mobility work, and you're always wanting to have riding. It's just where's the bulk of the energy going? You know, are, are you do you know that I'm going to be working out hard in the gym and 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 really emphasizing these things here? And so I need to understand that that's going to affect my riding. Cut back on that just a little bit. Maybe not look to have as many hard rides during that period of time. Uh, versus, you know, when riding is it, like I'm going to make sure that I'm not in the gym, whatever I'm doing in the gym is not going to make me sore and tired and beat up so that I can emphasize my riding, you know, but then there's times when you're going to have to get a little sore and tired and beat up to make the gains, have it affect your riding a little bit so that you can, can move forward. So, um, you know, hopefully that makes sense. Again, I wish I had like just real simple answers for you, but a lot of this stuff is mindset it's just understanding how to look at stuff and once you understand how to look at things all of a sudden the solutions start presenting themselves like you know like a lot of the stuff that i've been talking about today is just how to look at your workouts it's a mindset that i use when i'm looking at strength training stuff for mountain bikers and uh and, and when you start to use it all of a sudden you'll start to see things differently as well um but uh yeah so that idea of, of mo you know using hard moderate and easy workouts and rides and um, understanding the, the, the importance of having a long-term plan so that you can emphasize certain things during certain times and emphasize certain things at other times um, while still making sure you have all those things covered. Because, uh, I mean, honestly, the other thing too, like, like you said, you know, some, some back pain. I mean, if you're hurt, it don't matter how fit you are. That was like one of the big epiphanies that I had, like one of my early strength coaching mentors, Ian King, um, uh, wrote that. And, you know, his, his thing was like, what's the point of a training program? Is it performance enhancement or is it injury prevention? What's the number one priority? Because everything can't be most important, right? Only one thing can be most important. What's the, what's the one most important thing? Is it performance enhancement or injury prevention? And most people would say uh, performance enhancement, right? And, and that's kind of where the mindset of like riding and riding and riding and not taking the time to do some of these other things comes in because the performance enhancement comes from the riding. But uh, like he pointed out that if you're hurt, it don't matter how fit you are. And the athlete that is able to avoid injuries, more injuries over the long term, is actually going to end up in a better place. So if you have an athlete who's training their face off but is getting hurt every you know six to eight months and having to take time off versus an athlete who maybe isn't training as aggressively, maybe isn't seeing as quick short-term results as the other guy but he's avoiding those injuries he's seeing an injury once every you know uh you know year and a half to two years kind of thing who's going to be further along in five ten years kind of thing and so again it's keeping the long view on stuff like that really helps but uh, again that's why this stuff it, it, strength training is not optional i mean honestly because if you're not doing it you're setting yourself up for an injury and if you did nothing else, right, if there was no injury, if there was no performance enhancement that came from strength training, which luckily there is, if nothing else, all you got was just that it helped you avoid some overuse injuries and some things like that, then that would still be worth it. It would still be more than worth it because it's going to um, definitely help you in the long run. So anyways, um, cool. Ryan says that uh, referring what I needed to hear. Awesome. So I'm glad that helped out. Well, right on, everyone. So unless anyone's got any other questions, I think that's going to uh, wrap it up. Um, again, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this. I always enjoy doing these webinars. 
Uh, these things are a lot of fun for me getting the chance to interact with uh, you guys that get to attend. And, and if you didn't get to attend or listen to this after the fact, then just getting to share some of my knowledge to help you guys avoid a lot of the mistakes that I made. Um, so remember, I've, you know, I'm not perfect at this at all. I, a lot of the stuff that I share with you guys is based on the mistakes and the things that I've done and had to learn the hard way. And so uh, just trying to help you guys avoid those as well. But um, yeah, so adding these exercises in, especially the stagger stance and the puddle stance stuff and the windmill, you know, the mace is going to be fun. Um, but, uh, you know, those things right there are going to make a huge difference in your program. And uh, especially with how well you're able to see that transfer to the trail. So, um, well, right on. Well, once again, everybody, it's been James Wilson with uh, MTV Strength Training Systems. You guys can check me out at uh, bikejames.com. I've got one last question on when is the new Ultimate MTV Workout Program coming out. The update is coming out on Friday. So uh, what is today, 12, 15? So if you guys are listening to this after the fact, then uh, the newest update will be out by then. But um, yeah, tomorrow I'll have a little uh, comment contest uh, thing I'm doing. With the blog, I'll give you guys a chance to win a free copy of it. But uh, yeah, version six is coming out just in time for uh, for off season training. So uh, no, didn't get any May stuff in this one, but uh, we'll definitely be incorporating some May stuff in some future versions um, as, as more people get into it. So, uh, anyways, uh, so cool. Well, like I said, once again, check me out at uh, bikejames.com. Really enjoyed doing this, and uh, everybody got a chance to attend. Appreciate you attending and I will talk to everyone later.